I'm Kevin. I'm Martin. Hi, I'm Neil, and this is Youth on Subjects of the World. And today, we are going to be interviewing uh, Kevin Olson. Is that your, that's how I pronounce it, right? Yeah, you got right. it. And that's Martin's dad, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, you're correct. We're going to be talking about education, things, and uh, I guess whatever we want to talk about, because we can do whatever we want. We're rebellious teens. Now, so does anyone want to, I guess, get things moving? So as um, his son, I've sort of grown up as his son, as you do. And um, so basically, I've always found, I've always actually wanted to have him on the show because I, f- I feel like his growing up pro- process and how he got, he's gotten to where he is like in life and like just his experience with education and things like that is really interesting and relevant to what we often talk about on here. So um, I think if we want to start this off like right away with just the most simple of answer, how was your education experience growing up? <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say, do you want me to like talk about my education history? Yeah, go ahead. It's pretty short. So I dropped out of high school in 11th grade. Um, kind of like you, it was like a mutual like sort of expulsion slash dropping out. And what I mean by that is I didn't attend enough classes to get a, uh, attain a passing grade in anything by the time I was in 11th grade. So I had a chat with the principal and I said, I don't really want to be here. And she said, it seems like it. And also you staying here, at least for the rest of this year, makes no sense because you cannot mathematically pass anything. So she said, why don't you go home for the rest of the year? Um, and then maybe come back next year. And I said, how about I go home for the rest of the year and then never come back? And that's actually what ended up happening. I got my GED, um, high school equivalency diploma, it's sometimes called, um, about two months after I dropped out and I entered the workforce. And that was it. So making that decision, like, was that, a con- was that a conscious decision you thought about or was it more of a school um, sucks? I mean, I'd love to say I was, be- I was being very conscientious and thinking long and hard and, and, you know, making a decision and, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't want to inject like wisdom and intelligence into my 17 or 18 year old self that didn't actually exist. So I'm not going to pretend that it was a good decision at the time or that I thought it was a good decision. <clears throat> I was basically um, extremely, um, nihilistic and uncaring about school. Um, it wasn't doing anything for me and, um, there was nothing I liked about it and and it was just a miserable experience. So I was looking for a way to get out and kind of escape. And at the time I was thinking maybe I can just take a year off and make some money. And if I get my GED, I'm pretty sure I can get to like a community college or like something like that and then try and make something of myself. But I hadn't at the time kind of fully formed any type of educational philosophy that conformed to like, this is, you know, actually not only <clears throat> um, okay to do, but probably the best thing I could have done at the time that came later. Um, once, once I got married and we started having kids. Fascinating. So, so okay, yeah, what were you saying, Martin? I was, I was going to say, so like, not to drive the conversation because obviously I know all of this, but people, everyone else doesn't. So Fine. what, wh- how would you like rate your education experience prior to high school? Um, pri- prior to high school. So like up through eighth grade. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were parts of it that I liked. Um, and there are a lot of it that I hated. Um, I hated the busy work. Um, I hated the constant testing and evaluating. Um, I liked some things. I liked uh, the music and art classes. I was a a band kid, um, especially in middle school. So I played saxophone um, and I really enjoyed playing music. And it was something that, you know, you do as a group with, you know, a group of your friends. And um, I found that immensely satisfying. The art classes were like, 
cool because it was an excuse to sit in a spot and draw for an hour and that was an activity I enjoyed doing although I don't know if there's any particular educational value to the art cl classes that you take at you know public middle school um, what else I was um, I managed to kind of weasel my way into um, they had this program called gateway do you guys know what that is have you ever heard of that I don't think so, I've heard of that it's like it's like it's like for like high high academic performing students even though i was not high ap academic mm -hmm. performing at all um, my mother <clears throat> when i was younger was working a lot with the school to try and see if i had like a learning disability and all of this stuff and one of the things that she suggested because i t i i scored really well on tests um, as a kid even though i was terrible in general at school i was always able to pretty much you know eat breeze through testing standardized tests and so forth so my mother made the case to the school like look um he's obviously got some intelligence and maybe he's just <laughs> not being challenged enough so put him in the gifted and, and talented programs what gateway is so they put me in that <clears throat> and i like that a lot now this is literally it's almost like an after school thing it doesn't count for anything there's it's not graded um and it's literally it's just education and enri enrichment and they do different things like um, they did a unit that lasted like half a year, I think, where you basically um, studied uh, different inventors. So we studied Leonardo da Vinci and all of this stuff. And I got into drawing all of these like schematics and diagrams like da Vinci does, like <clears throat> with the inventions and stuff. And we um, we did this thing where we pretended we were a, a, like a, a startup, like a company, and we're bringing a new product to market. And each person got to play a different role. Um, you know, like I'm going to be the technologist and this person is going to be, you know, the ad executive and this person is going to, you know, handle the finances. And we kind of like go through that. And they did um, mock trials, which is like um, mock court, basically. So you kind of like you play the, the role of a lawyer um, or a judge um, in some cases and you go through a trial and you basically try to litigate <coughs> um, a, a, a hypothetical or a fake scenario. And those were all like really cool, engaging things that didn't count for anything, didn't mean anything, didn't impact my grades at all. But like, that's the thing that I remember from middle school. So, I think like, that kind of, I guess, highlights how, I guess, traditional public school, it, it doesn't really support anything other than, or the grading system, uh, rather doesn't really support anything other than like this, the, like the, this is what matters and this is what will count towards your grade. Nothing else actually really matters. Um, and yeah, I guess that just, I think it really speaks to just how rigid it is and how it really just doesn't, there's not much leeway for what can count towards your grade and what you can pursue. If you want to get a good grade and you want to pass, you're going to have to follow uh, these exact standards, take the tests, pass the tests, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, I mean, they need a way to measure. Um, yeah. The reason they need a way to measure is because it's public funds that fund it for the most part. For most kids, they go to public school or if they go to private school, it closely follows the public school model. Mm -hmm. And, you know, measurement is a big part of that. But I think the problem is um, when you're like, like there's like a kind of a cooking analogy, right? Like if you're, if you're baking, like you don't know if you messed up the recipe until the re until it's done. Like you can't really tell midway through. Sometimes you can't like if yeah. it's not rising correctly or whatever, but like there's no way to know until the finished product is there if you did it well or not. <clears throat> and I think like, you know, turning small human beings into adult human beings that are productive citizens and whatnot is kind of like that. Like you don't know what components are going into a person's life <clears throat> and experience that are going to impact them or send them in a certain direction until they're like heading in that direction. Um, but that's not, you know, that's not measurable in a way that's uh, satisfactory for, you know, taxpayers who are de demanding, you know, how is their money being spent to educate kids. So mm -hmm. we kind of have this other process that is, I think, a little bit false in a way. I like it doesn't like really, it doesn't really um, tell the full story or it tells the wrong story. Kevin, did you ever have like like an epiphany moment about education? Yeah, I did, but like I said, it wasn't until I was an adult. Um, well, so, like, yeah, yeah. So when Martin was, I don't know, two, um, his mom, my wife Karen, suggested that maybe we homeschool. And honestly, I had ne like it had never occurred to me that we would do anything other than what every parent does 
in the United States, which is send your kid to school when they're six years old. But I was open to the idea, so I was like, well, tell me more. What What is this? <clears throat> and um, she had been, um, I think this is the case in a lot of families where the mom kind of goes into research mode and starts looking at things. But yeah. um, one thing that's, that's unique about our family is I'm more the researcher. Uh, my wife uh, definitely, you know, learns about a lot, um, but she had learned about um, this fellow named John Holt. Do you guys know who that is? Mm. Yeah, I've heard him definitely. Okay, so John Holt was a guy who um, kind of started the homeschooling movement in the in the early '70s, and he he published a bunch of books. He was a, he was an educator. He was an elementary school um, educator who became basically disenchanted with the education system and decided to um, <clears throat> try and figure out if there's a way to support families through homeschooling. And back in the seventies, like there's no internet. It's really hard to connect with people. There aren't that many people doing it, maybe 10,000 as opposed to the millions that are doing it today. So he wrote a bunch of books about it. And one of them that he wrote is called growing without schooling. And it's basically, it's, it's like, an unschooling handbook of sorts. And I read that book and <clears throat> it resonated with me so much because he, you know, with his background as an educator, he was describing scenarios that he observed because the guy was just a, a very, very keen, you know, observer of human behavior, especially in children. And he just described these scenarios that like, it was so uncanny to, to read about them because they were my experiences when I was a kid. And, you know, I got through that, the end of that book and I went from, you know, my wife saying, hey, maybe we should ho homeschool, <clears throat> you know, and she was, I think, I don't want to speak for her, but I think her main drive was like, she didn't want to give up um, the bonding and, and, you know, time with our kids mm -hmm. um, and have, have them somewhere else for six, eight hours a day. I got through that book and I was like, wow, public education is flawed. We need to, you know, homeschool all of our kids. And more than that, we probably need to look at unschooling. Um, <clears throat> and it was kind of like a walking backwards because I, like I said, before we had kids and, and you know, before Martin reached that age where Karen said that to me, I hadn't given it too much thought. But at that point, it was like kind of an epiphany of like, oh, <clears throat> this is actually a thing that we should probably spend some some time thinking about it. I just started reading every book I could about the topic um, we went to some conferences uh, with other homeschooling families talked about the topic some more um, we have four kids now none of them have been to school um, I guess if they want if one of them came to me and said I really want to go to public school I mean we wouldn't we wouldn't say no but we're also pretty realistic with what the what, you know what the uh, <clears throat> pros and cons of it are and what the pitfalls would be uh, and so forth. So that's kind of, that's kind of how it evolved. It was a little bit of a, uh, uh, forwards to backwards of me discovering that there's actually an educational movement that ties to the struggle and dissatisfaction I had as a kid and as a student. Um, and that, you know, plotted a sensible path forward that might let my kids escape some of that misery if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So to back up a little bit, how did you get from point A of being like, of drop, of basically essentially being half expelled, half dropping out of high school yeah, to, and trying to figure out like what you wanted to do and like just kind of being in that situation and scenario where you don't really know what's going on to getting to a point where you're married with a child? Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> some hard work, a lot of happy coincidences, um, and, and, you know, a little bit of being in the right place at the right time and a little bit of, you know, opportunities presenting themselves. So, I mean, when I dropped out of high school, I, <clears throat> I pretty much believed the, the common American myth of you have to go to college to be a successful person, right. to be a successful, happy person and be able to make enough money to support yourself and support a family. Like there's really no way to do it in the modern age without a college education. Um, and that's not really true, but that's just to say that it's not true is not the whole story. Um, because, <clears throat> you know, you can't just drop out of high school and then get, you know, a six figure job. That's not, that's not how things work. Mm -hmm. Unless you're extremely gifted at you know 
a, a particular thing, I guess. Right. So, you know, my first job when, after I dropped out of school was loading trucks for UPS. I went, we have um, <clears throat> a sort facility that's 20 miles from my house. And I had a couple of other friends, um, one of which who recently graduated high school and another which, which who also had dropped out and was just looking for work. And we, um, we started working at UPS. They were looking for seasonal help and <clears throat> I loaded trucks. And they did that for about a year two year, a mm, little over a year, I guess. And that was a part-time job, but it had full benefits because um, UPS is a, a union company. <clears throat> so, all, it, you know, all mm -hmm. of its all of its uh, labor is unionized, so they get full benefits and all of this. You have to pay union dues, which are quite expensive. But um, so I did, I did that. I mean, it was not nothing very satisfying or great, um, but, you know, I worked four to six hours per day and I, br I brought home enough money to basically support myself. You know, I lived in a, in, a, in a small apartment with three other people. So I wasn't living a glamorous life by any stretch of the imagination. But it was more than I imagined was possible initially. <clears throat> so um, eventually I realized I'm going to have to get full time work if I wanted to. You know, at this point I was dating martin's wife we were boyfriend and girlfriend and i was thinking hey oh, my, <laughs> martin's, yeah. wife. martin's my, my i almost wife. said daughter dang it mother. mother all right sorry <laughs> you guys could have just like let me keep going and i never would have known i made that mistake i didn't even notice it i think it's i think <laughs> i i noticed it but understood what yeah, yeah. anyways martin's martin's oh, anyways I was dating a girl that I thought I was going to marry. So I was like, I'm going to need a little more money in my life so that I can actually like, you know, do adult things. So I got, I got full-time job. Um, and my next job was um, in a co company that uh, makes like injection molded plastic. So they make parts for other companies that build things. Um, so some of the things that I worked on there were like making parts for these um, plastic snowshoes that you can use for, you know, outdoor hike, winter hiking. Um, they made um, handles for pistols for the company Sig Sauer, which is a firearms company here in New Hampshire. Um, <clears throat> so I just, I just worked at that company. And the thing that I did there, and I think this is kind of what got me most of the opportunities that let me build from one thing to the next is I just tried to learn as much as I can about as many things as I could. So the first job I had there was um, running an injection molding machine. It's literally, it looks like a giant microwave. It's got metal molds in it and <clears throat> it's all super hot. And it slams together and hot plastic pours into it and then it opens up when it cools off and you've got a plastic part. You got to trim off all of the excess and all of this. So that's like the job that everybody starts with. So I did that for a while. And then um, they had, um, they had an opening for um, a parts a parts inspector. So a parts inspector takes like all of the parts that are coming out of these machines that the people are doing the first set of finish work on and kind of like gives them a once over and see if, if there's any imperfections and stuff. And if you're doing like um, medical, like medical parts and things like that, that's pretty important. So I was like the inspector. So I just literally just sort through parts and like throw away the bad things or put them aside and, and keep the good ones. <clears throat> and then um, the person who is the head of QA at that company, which is quality analysis, is like, hey, do you want to be a QA inspector? That's kind of like the next step up. So I went to that and I did that for a while. <clears throat> so like it's just a matter of like like there was a lot to learn at that job, even though it was kind of a menial job. Um, and I and I learned a lot of different things. And then eventually I realized that this job was quite far from my house. I realized I wanted to work closer to home. So I, I ended up applying for a place in the same town that I worked in. Similar type of work, um, you know, working with, it's a manufacturing type of job. <clears throat> and in this job, we did like, um, we did like um, products that the military used. So we made these, um, you ever see the movie Outbreak where they're in like the toxic hazmat suits? the giant suits with like the air breathing apparatus inside and stuff. They look like space suits. We made those. Um, we made these portable shelters, <clears throat> which inflate off the back of a Humvee for the military. It's like a field hospital. Um, and it's all basically um, plastic coated fabrics that are heat sealed together. Um, so I learned probably 20 different jobs at that place. Um, <clears throat> trying to, you know, like I said, learn as much as I can, be as useful as I can. And the thing is, when you can do a lot of things, you, you get more and more money. 
So that's always a good thing. But I was also kind of thinking, okay, I can either make a career in manufacturing where I'll, you know, I can become a manager maybe. And that's about as far as I, I'll go. Cause in those jobs, the more interesting work is the engineering work. And um, those guys typically um, they're mechanical engineers, so they have to have a degree. So that's the, you know, first degree sort of firewall that I hit. <clears throat> so I realized I had a friend who was studying uh, computer science and he was telling me that um, it's actually pretty easy to get some industry certificates in, in uh, information technology. You don't have to have a college degree at least right away to get an entry level job. So like, hmm, I like computers. I had always been a computer hobbyist. My father <clears throat> um, was a huge computer enthusiast. We had you know, probably the first computer on our block or whatever. Back in 1984, we had a Commodore Amiga uh, computer. So it was something that I was interested in and good at already, but I had never thought about turning it into something I could make money off of mm. until this conversation <clears throat> with a buddy of mine that I worked with. So he, funny thing is he ended up dropping out of computer science, but I was like, oh, I could do IT certification courses. So I did a bunch of IT certification courses and I turned it into an entry level help desk job. And that was the first job that I did in the career that I have now, which is information technology. I'm going to stop there because I've been talking for a while and find out if you guys have any questions. Oh, well, I, well, I know that um, Martin was saying you, you have a lot of opinions and like to rank. <laughs> so, okay. If you, do you have anything that like grinds your gears other than education? Because we don't really have to talk about just education. Um, but I just, if we are going to go off on a tangent, uh, I just have one last question about education really quick. Sure. So um, so what would be your, because a lot of times you talk about, or generally in the, I mean, we, a lot of people in, I guess, the alternative education community, if you will, say you can get into college, but you don't need to. And then we, I think yeah. we've had people on here before where we ask them, okay, what do you want it? What do you do if you want to get into college? Or we talk about how to get into college. So what do you, what would you recommend? for your own experiences as an example, and also, you know, learning from them and taking, you know, the good from the bad and say, if you don't want to go to college, what would be your advice? Because if you just, if maybe you don't know what you want to do, or you do know what you want to do, but you, yeah. do, you, know you don't want to go to college, what would be your advice in your, I guess, you know, put thrown out into the world or whatever you want to say? Um, my advice would be do everything you can not to go to college, unless you are trying to get, in, get into a field that has a stringent degree requirement. Hmm. So if you want to teach or you want to become a doctor or a lawyer, um, there's really no way to do that and, and have like a successful career. Um, well, teaching, maybe you might be able to find like an alternative school or something that will, will hire you without a, te without a teaching certificate. But for the most part, you really have to, you have to have a degree for those jobs. For just about everything else, um, the degree is a, sig is a signaling mechanism. It signals to employers that you have basic work, work ethic and can follow directions. Um, and that's an expensive um, message. To <laughs> an expensive uh, signal. Yeah, because, I mean, if, I don't know what a four-year degree costs these days. I don't know the exact numbers are, but I know it's pretty expensive. Um, and the fact of the matter is, you know, I am a person that, that you know, I'm, I manage other people in my career now so I hire people and I can tell you as a hiring manager um, there are other and stronger ways to signal that that work ethic and ability to sort of not necessarily follow directions but get along in a group and, and you know work together with others than having just a four-year degree in fact <clears throat> a four-year degree with nothing else isn't actually that strong a signal in the marketplace these days, I don't think, for, for a lot of jobs. When people now have college degrees, it's starting to become less of a, I mean, not the majority of people, I think, still don't have um, them, but it's still something that's less, it's less of a outlying thing now. Yeah. It, it, it seems like a lot, like I like to cook a lot, and I don't think I'm very interested in being a chef, but I know like in cooking, when you're looking to hire, I don't know, like a chef, you're not really looking for someone that goes to culinary school. Like that's, that's helpful, but it doesn't really do much, but it's much better to have like an apprenticeship at a, I don't know, high class restaurant. Yeah. I, I you know, like I that's think worth so much more than a degree from, I don't know, from culinary school. I mean, I don't know anything about the world of, you know, culinary arts or I don't even know if that's what you <laughs> call it. 
I don't but know. I guess it so. seems to me that the way you become really successful and well known in that in that world is through is through experimentation and creativity. Um, and those are things that are free to anybody that's willing to expend a little bit of time and, and you know, risk mm -hmm. some bad outcomes in the early goings um, to to gain that um, that trait. <clears throat> so that's not something that you can be taught, really, um, mm -hmm. either in school or in college. And, you know, Neil, I think it's funny <clears throat> because I often – like I said, we've been to like homeschooling conferences and I read a lot of materials and that that's a question that comes up. Like parents are worried, like, are my kids going to get to college if I unschool them or if I homeschool them? And like, I just think that's starting with the wrong premise. It's like, well, what is it they want to do? Right. Yeah. And is, is college even the right choice? It's like, if you're, if you're, if you're making such paradigm shifting, like questions and decisions in your child's educational life early on, then why not continue doing that into, you know, young adulthood and into, you know, the, the phase of their life where they're going to have a career or, you know, follow some passion, um, which will, you know, hopefully bring them, <clears throat> you know, happiness or contentment and, you know, financial security and all of this. Um, I, I think college is a bit of a, it, I don't want to call it a sham, but it is certainly a, it's certainly a, it's certainly close a, to it. It's a myth. It's a myth that everybody college either, either believes or does not exist. <laughs> it's it's a myth that so the the myth that you have to be go to college to be successful is something that is starting to be questioned, but not in a way that's serious enough to to actually change most people's course of action. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's why I think it's important to not just start with that premise without questioning it. Um, <clears throat> like it's fine. Like I'm and don't get me wrong. I didn't go to college, so I can't sit here and tell you college is a waste of time authoritatively. I don't know that I didn't, I didn't do that. So if you want to know if college is a waste of time, you should probably ask somebody who went to college. Um, that's not me. But what I do know is you can have a successful life without college. And what I also know is it's very expensive and most people um, go into debt in order to do it. <clears throat> and the vast, vast majority of people go into debt and stay in debt for decades after that. And indebtedness is probably this uh, another big myth that, or not a myth, but it's another thing that people in, by and large don't understand what it means to be in debt. Um, and, yeah, and, and the impact that indebtedness has on your life and your ability to be productive and do the things that you want to do. So starting your adult life by taking on a giant chunk of debt that you are responsible for paying off is not something you should do without thinking very, very thoroughly about what it is mm. you're going to get out of that. It is. And it if, is really. That's worth it. It is really funny. The thing about college is like how stupid it sounds from someone that's never heard of it. It's like, let's start off these kids that are young and stupid who don't really understand what the rest of their life is going to be like. And let's set them off being a hundred thousand dollars in debt. Yeah. And I really, and let's start but, them off also when and, they go to college, they don't even know what they want to do. So they're going to have to sit there and think, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? What should my major be? And when you're, when you're going to be paying that hundred thousand dollars, you're going to have no way of making any actual money or no guarantee that you'll ever make any money from the hundred thousand dollars. So like, it's an investment that you're not even sure you'll make any money off of for like, I don't know, the first like 10 years. Mm -hmm. like I really think that college is used as a Sometimes you don't make any money off of it. I think college a lot of times is used for a scapegoat for people. They just like, they're like, I don't know what my kids want. They don't know what their kids want to do. That scares them. And they don't know what they, they're going to do because they don't know what they, what the kids want to do. And it scares them even more. So like, if I just send them to college and they're in college, that means they're successful and I can just, I'm done. I'm, I have succeeded as a parent. And I feel like that's, and it's the same thing for the kids. I think they're just like, well, I don't know what I want to do. I have, I have absolutely no idea what I want to do. I have no idea what I want to do with my life. I have nothing. I have no idea what's going to happen after high school. So I guess I'll just go to college because I just think it's used as a scapegoat for go to college because that's the next step. There's, it's just as, it's just as a, a scapegoat for instead of, think, instead of just actually getting on with like, and I'm not saying college is important because I actually want to go to college because I want to be a dietitian right now, at least I could do my mind and I need to go to college to do that. But if you don't have a specific need to go to college, think critically before you actually make that decision. Well, 
I think also a problem that I'm positive exists because I have multiple friends who have basically fallen into the scenario is just like people don't want to piss off their parents. Right. And a lot of people end up like, well, I guess I'm going to college and being in debt for the rest of my life because I don't want to, like, tell my parents I'm not going to college. And they've sent, like, I've had multiple friends who have kind of fallen into that trap. And I have multiple friends who are, like, looking at falling into that trap. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a lot of social reinforcement for following the path of get good grades, graduate high school, go to college, um, both for the, the student and their parents. There is not a lot of social reinforcement to look at many, if any, uh, alternate paths. And that's not always been the case, by the way. I think, um, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, there were a lot of viable paths to, you know, sort of the American dream, if you will, through, you know, trades, blue collar jobs, that type of thing. Or just being an entrepreneur, you know, open open a restaurant, open a bakery, like, do, you know, do something. Um, <clears throat> and that you didn't necessarily have to go to college for that. But that's really um, and the focus on academics um, in the last 20 to 30 years has really kind of flipped that around. Um, and, you know, it's hard because the kid might see a reality of, wow, I don't know if this is right for me or this seems scary. And, oh, that's a lot of money for me to you know, borrow on this, <clears throat> on this student loan. I don't, I'm not sure I don't want to do yet, but it's also scary for the, the parents and the parents are in a situation where there's zero social reinforcement. So it's like, you know, they feel like they're bad parents basically if their kids aren't, aren't, you know, grade A students and going to college. And the funny thing is the people who get the most at, like the people <laughs> who are scamming all these people are, is like the government. They're the ones that are like telling you everything to do. And they're like, controlling everyone well um so they, they definitely they definitely have greatly contributed to the rise in, in sort of the profile of college education as the primary means to move from adolescence into an, into adulthood basically cheap cheap loans and subsidized loans yes yeah, so uh, that's that's the funniest part is like like what is it in i don't know the 70s 60s or 70s they had this whole thing where politicians were like if you vote for me i'll guarantee you these college loans and then they got in the office and they did that and then it screwed up everything because colleges are like all right well you can we can charge as much as we want because there's going to be these like great loans that these kids can buy so we can basically charge as much as we want people will still come then now it's like politicians are pol <laughs> are promising Oh well, we'll get rid of these evil college loans for you, and we'll pay them off. But it's like, well, it's a yeah, problem they like create. Debt, debt forgiveness or free free college. Yeah, it's like it's like the government creates this problem, and and they're like, if you vote for me, I'll fix I'll fix this problem. And then they screw it up, and they're like, if you vote for me, I'll fix this problem that I made. It's like, why should we have to? I'm like, that's just so stupid. Mm -hmm. And now college is super expensive. Like before, there's all these loans. It's like, well, college isn't that expensive. Yeah. Also, people are actually to, paying money for it. To back it up a little to um, Neil's thing about like college, uh, like <laughs> yeah, specific Neil's thing about like people's reviews of college and how you said you didn't go to college so you can't really review it. I was actually, I I tried to talk to a lot of people about a lot of things to just kind of expand my knowledge of other people's ideas and opinions. And I was talking to someone who went to college, got a degree, degree in engineering works in engineering who was talking about how he does not think people should go to college unless they are like once again absolutely positive what they want and knows that they need a college degree for it and he the example he used was he told me about he told me about two different cases one of the cases was um two people who he met in college who also met in college who started dating got married after like college and both of them are so far into debt that they can't afford a house. So they live in one of their parents like house with them and they can't start a family cause they have too much debt. And only one of them works in the like air, the field that he studied in. The other one doesn't like half, like realize essentially halfway through, Oh, I don't really want to do this, but 
I can't really change now, so I guess I'll just finish this off and then get a job somewhere else. Because I think our society really supports um, going to college, but they don't really support thinking about what you want to do. Yeah. Um, like, they'll say, but, oh, Billy, what do you want to do when you grow up? It's like, okay, it's like, oh, it's a cute, fun question, but, oh, when you go to, co- go to college, so you can be paying tens of thousands of dollars to just be sitting there and thinking what you should have been doing years ago. Dude, Little Billy, you haven't yeah, used little the Little Billy that. example in so long. But <laughs> anyways, and then the second example that was used was another person he met in college who was a friend of his who was thrown into college and was just completely overwhelmed, like absolutely horribly overwhelmed, was studying something he didn't care about. Re- like he realized a couple months in he didn't care about it. And he was so completely like just drowning essentially in the amount of work he had to do. So he dropped out and he went to trade school to be a mechanic. And now he owns a car dealership and like, just like worked his way up in that system until he's gotten into a place that's just like he he has like used cars and like also he's a mechanic so he fixes them up and then resells them and he does this and he makes the same amount of money in a year that his friends are in debt to so those were the two examples he gave and you can be a low in the car the car the car dealership business is pretty lucrative it has a lot of money in it and in like my my dad he got a master's degree in electrical engineering and he actually he could have actually stayed for and finished his phd he just had to stay for like two more years he he had written his doctoral thesis he just needed to wait like two more years and do you know which field he works in now consulting that's that's what he works he works in consulting um so yeah he said i mean he says his degree helped him because I mean, when someone sees a degree, or at least when someone, I don't know how it is now, maybe it's, it's possible, it's changed. They're like, oh, this person, you know, perhaps, you know, knows some of what they're doing and oh, they're respected. But honestly, uh, look, it's it's just, and you also have to, I remember I, I watched this one video on YouTube of this guy who got a PhD, and he was talking about how people will tell him that he's overqualified for a position. Like, he, no, he's overfocused. He's overfocused on something else. Like PhDs get this like bad treatment. He's like, I don't think I, I can't believe that this happened. Yeah, and that's where <laughs> that's where it's a signaling me- mechanism, but it's actually signaling the opposite of what you want. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of scary. That can happen, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you, you guys could play a game called "Ask People If They're Doing What They What Their Degree Is For." <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. um, that, and that's something that I do. So even though I didn't go to college, I do ask people because it comes up. Like in my professional life, like I don't hide the fact. Like people, you know, in in when my colleagues or my coworkers are talking about like their educational background, like they all know that I didn't graduate high school. They think it's kind of funny. Um, but most of most of my colleagues, most of the people that I work with do not have degrees that are relevant to the careers they actually pursue. That is is the case at least more than 50% of the time, which is a a pretty big percentage if you think about it. I can't really think of anyone that I know that has a degree in what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I work, I work, I work, I work with a lot of software developers. So there are a lot of people who, you know, they graduate computer science yeah. programs and go, go on to software development. So technically speaking, their degree does directly really relate to their career. However, the one thing that I hear from a lot of software engineers is, yes, I have a computer science degree, but the only thing that was really valuable that I learned in college when earning my degree was when I went on internships and learn what actual program languages and methodologies were <clears throat> in place to build real products. Because the thing too about colleges is unless you go to a really top notch engineering school, a lot of what you're learning is pretty outdated by the time, by the time it's in the curriculum in the, in the colleges and what is happening, like technology is so fast moving, you know, you, you could be lo- learning dead programming languages. And then you get into, you know, the professional world and realize the new hotness is this thing over here. And you never once got to touch it unless maybe you did an internship, you know, over the summer for a company that uses it or something like that. Um, actually, so, you, so even in, in cases where the, the degree is relevant, sometimes the actual knowledge that you gain from it is not particularly relevant. I also have like an, an interesting anecdote about, because um, I, I, I heard that, Industry sometimes, if there are 
um, professions and colleges that industries may be involved in, they will actually have some industry funding involved with the education of that. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to a, a dietitian in Shopper because I was like, oh, I should, because my mom was saying to me, you know, there's this dietitian in Shopper, right? we can go and talk to her because that's what you want to do. And I'm like, that sounds cool. So we went and talked to her and, and it was actually kind of, it was kind of weird because so, one of the questions I was asking is about industry funding and things like that. And, and I don't know if I asked specifically in relation to education. I think I did. I did mention it. And she just kind of got like, yeah, there's a lot of that. You got to be careful. I was like, oh my God, this is some like shady shit that goes on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's just, so this is like, cause it, it's different from like reading on the internet or hearing people talk about on the internet, but when there's like someone in front of you saying, yeah, that's something you got to watch out. It's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's very like, I think that's one of the most interesting things about living in age that we do is like you can read all of these things on the internet, like especially about for me at least about education, mm-hmm. it, like all. And I believe my beliefs to be 100 percent true, but I'm also someone who doubts like like tries to doubt everything at least a little bit just to like not ever completely write something off as impossible. So when I have conversations with people like in person about these subjects and it's like a confirmation of like, yeah, that's pretty much the case. It's like, it's like, you're like, yeah, that's, that's like, I was right about this, but it's also like kind of scary. Like, oh, wow. That's actually like really depressing that so many people fall into things like that. Like, um, like when I see people who like get their degrees in like gender studies and then they're like working in like a Coles, it's like, Dude, what did you do? What have you done? Exactly. Yeah, there's, there's so many times where people uh, overestimate the power a degree has to a severe extent. I think people also try to, they, they kind of equate an, a degree with one, um, intelligence, and two, and this was something that surprises me, sometimes even people with these degrees don't have a lot of knowledge on the topic. Um, which is really weird. Well, because when there's something like the internet and then there's something like a curriculum that a professor is using, which do you think is going to update faster to the newer information of the world? Like college is essentially outdated in the sense that the things that you're learning in college in certain fields are not going to, like what my dad said, they're not going to be relevant to what, you're actually going to be doing, especially if you're someone who's going to work in technology and you plan on going to college for technology. Like if you were to go to technology, like into technology for college right this second, and even if you were to learn all the like current things, you'd still probably be outdated by the time you were actually in the workforce because it's a, it's going so quickly. Like it's advancing at a, a rate that is faster than ever before in history. Right. And, and unless you're working at the most abstract level of software, like, you know, machine, machine language and things like that, a huge component of building software is understanding how human beings work. Right. Um, you have to understand, like, what are the things they're going to want to touch in a UI? Um, you know, where are people going to look for certain elements and features? Like, there's a huge, there's a huge aspect of it that, like, you just don't learn in school at all. It's, it's intuitive and it's it's like um, it's like emotional intelligence as opposed to hard intelligence, meaning like being empathetic and, and understanding how people think and, and what their inclinations and motivations are. Um, and you know that com- that comes into play too when you're working you know within a team in a company or or you know on a project if you're <clears throat> doing something entrepreneurial like, you have to figure out how to play nicely in the sandbox with other people and get your ideas across and be empathetic to other people's ideas. And the people who are the most successful um, at doing those things are usually the ones who are most successful in, in the larger game of we're building software or we're doing a th- you know, we're doing a technology thing. Um, and not necessarily the people who understand the code the, the very best, although that's helpful too. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I did want to get back to uh, the tangent thing. Yeah, the tangent. Yeah. yeah so, was, okay. 
so yeah, he as I've mentioned, he like he has strong opinions on things, and the, if you really want to set him off, if that's what your plan is, the the bigot he has strong feelings about politics, like especially like current U.S. politics and. I hope you something we don't all agree on. That'll be. Well, I'm not sure if there. I I think we might be on the same page on most of it. Ah, what? Damn it. Why don't you guys just ask some questions? All right. All right. Well, what are your strong political views, like Martin just said? <laughs> no, I'm interested. <laughs> I, right. I'm, I, I mean, not. I don't. Yeah, I, that's a hard question to answer because I'm going to give you like a soundbite answer, right? <clears throat> um, yeah. Political views are are you know human interaction views. I think. So more specific. So if I question? have to boil it down into a if I have to boil it down into a sound sound bite, I am like extremely li- libertarian to the point mm-hmm. where if I you know was on a tightrope and I fell off to the side, it would be basically anarchy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so no, 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 I didn't have anything. Mark, Mark. That was me, but you can you can go because I already know all of this. I live with him. <laughs> I don't know what to. I, I'm definitely very familiar with anarchism and. Uh, I know Neil has a few questions about libertarianism because Neil doesn't like it sometimes. I yeah I I generally I think if okay, I, tell I, I me what you don't like about libertarianism. All right, so I generally don't. I just want to explain it really quick. I don't really position really quick. I don't really like socialism or libertarianism. If I had to pick one that was worse, it'd probably be it'd definitely be socialism. Socialism is way worse than libertarianism, probably because socialism has a uh, blood on its hands, like a lot, a lot of communism have so much blood on its hands it's kind of disgusting and uh, libertarianism has almost no blood on their hands since mm. it's the default state of being kind of um but so yeah i guess one of the one of the things that i've always kind of wondered about libertarianism is well how is if you don't have any if you don't have many or any regulations on uh, the economy and it's not like we don't have proof like like case examples of like anecdotes and case studies of this is like monopolies controlling certain things like this is something that I had a problem with was the libertarians uh, explanation of net neutrality, like something Martin, uh, I think was your position on or something like that was that, well, and this is something I had people talking to me like, well, the, well, I mean, you have competition and things like that. So, I mean, what does net neutrality matter if we have yeah. this co- competing things? It's like, well, that's not the reality of the situation. We have these companies that have monopolies on it that literally divide the country up into territories and any single competitor that gets into that business will be like put thrown out of that, uh, in a second, and any and if they try to take them to court, that's a joke because that's never going to happen. Because um, they have they have teams upon teams and teams of teams of lawyers um, with their insane amount of money, uh, sure. just able to you know stop anyone out. And I remember we were talk I was talking to someone, and uh, they were saying that something that Walmart does is that they they will they they don't care about winning the case. Because they'll just drag it out until you're so, until you're bone dry money and you just can't afford and you have to settle. Then they'll slam you back with a lawsuit and with a countersuit, and then they take you for everything after you've been drained the money and you can't continue with the case. Yeah. So yeah, it's like monopolies yeah. are. Yeah. yeah, that's that's that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know about that Walmart example. That's pretty cutthroat. Um, <laughs> and, and but you know, so net neutrality is a pretty complicated topic because. Yeah. Um, the way the internet came into being is pr- pretty complex and it was kind of a quasi governmental thing to begin with. Um, but the, the main case against net, uh, the main case for net neutrality that I think you stated pretty well is like, these companies are too big. We have to regulate them. Um, they have armies of lawyers, they have deep pockets, limitless resources. Um, so there's gotta be a, a way to stand up for the little guy. The problem is regulation doesn't end up standing up for the little guy because there's a thing called regulatory capture. Do you know what that is? Uh, what is that? So regular regulatory capture is, is a phrase that describes what ends up happening in any heavily regulated industry, which is that people who are part of that industry, AKA executives or high ranking people in the companies that are being regulated end up becoming the regulators. And guess what they do? They author, craft, and enforce regulations that are fav- favorable to their friends that are still in the big companies and very hostile to- towards newer companies uh, or disruptors that are trying to be innovative and come up with new technology. And that's why, like, I don't necessarily disagree with the problem statement of you have some really big companies. They appear to have too much power 
what can we do about it? The thing I disagree with is the proposed solution makes the problem worse by any measure as far as I can see. Because when regulatory capture comes into play, it's basically the Comcast and Google's and Verizon's of the world that run those regulatory bodies. <clears throat> those chairmen are always ex-industry executives, and they claim it's all oh, it's expertise. You know, we need people who are experts in this industry to be able to regulate them, and maybe that's true. But um, the other thing <clears throat> that happens is the more regulated an industry becomes, the more expensive it becomes to be a player in that industry. Because there's a there's a real cost to being able to come up come to conformancy with all of these laws and regulations to know what they are. You got to hire lawyers. I mean, you're not running afoul of things. You got to set your infrastructure up in a certain way. So, if I wanted to start an internet company tomorrow, and the internet had <clears throat> the internet as an industry had tons and tons of regulations that. Comcast and Verizon and Charter and whoever else had no problem complying with because they're huge multinational, you know, billions of dollar plus corporations. And I'm just a startup. I'm dead before I even get started. So you're really entrenching the moneyed interests by by introducing heavy regulation rather than doing doing <clears throat> what what you can about it. and that's not to say that not regu like if you deregulate yeah it's possible that there's going to be some companies that are just so great at what they do and 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 you know have so much of an advantage and a head start that you're going to be hard to catch up with but i think open competition has a better chance of disrupting those companies than regulation does so i mean i guess i would ask why why would these um because i mean net neutrality it's not like it's a it's a plethora of regulations. It is just saying basically, you know, the data, I mean, it definitely can uh, squelch money-making uh, possibilities um, because it, it literally just says all data must be treated equally. You can't charge more. Like if you have, you can't have like TV, like, like a- Well, for, well the, the problem with it is the, the, that, that is an undefinable statement to begin with. So this is another problem with regulatory capture is it's just English words that are open to interpretation. So what does that mean? All data must be treated equally. Um, well, I guess, well, obviously, well, all laws, to be clear, are interpreted. That's what the judicial branch of course, is for. Of course. Um, but, the, but, but, this is, but this is a rulemaking body that is not, that is unelected, right? Right, the FCC. These are, these are, these are, these are people who are appointed. Right. That just that just get together and say what should the rules be, and they write and they write words down, and they're also happen to be responsible for enforcing yeah. them. So they write their own rules. I really like the idea of having these different branches of the government that are completely unelected. I know. So yeah. we can get off on a tangent of that. So let's stay. <laughs> let's stay with the question. You're yeah. Asking. So, um, sorry. What was it? What was the last thing you just said before we kind of where I kind of went off on so, it. about the FCC being up for interpretation? Like when they write laws. Okay, just, right. So you made this. You, you started to say. Um, right, and then you're saying, well, it's up to like interpretation. Yeah, you started to say that the basis of net neutrality is that all data must be treated equally, and I and I and I guess I'm challenging you to 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 put some definition around that because okay. basically um, there's a lot of ways that data is not treated equally, both. Pr pre net neutrality the pre the decision to end net neutrality and post mm -hmm. um, that i think are glossed over because they're you know technical in nature and most people don't understand it like there's a lot of like rhetoric around net neutrality that talks about the internet being an information highway and you know there's traffic cops and like trying to do these tortured analogies but the truth of the matter is data is not treated equally like data prioritization happens um, at the packet level, everywhere you can possibly have an internet, an internetworked device connected. What do you mean by on that level? Like I understand packets, like data is is like you know transferred through packets on the internet. But what do you, what do you mean by? What I mean is it's it's impossible to it's impossible to deliver content in a meaningful way that would be satisfactory to any customers of these companies if they didn't do some level of, of traffic prioritization. And also there's, a, there's different dimensions by which traffic can be big or small. Um, there's, there's, um, there's caps. So um, Comcast used to have a 250 gig per month cap. So that's the total data you can consume in a month. So you can transfer this many bytes of data 
in a 30 day period. Mm -hmm. That's one dimension of analysis. Another dimension of analysis is throughput. So if I have a one gigabit <clears throat> uh, internet circuit, most of the time I can be using like this video call right now might be using 0.2% of my total available throughput. But if I wanted to have a hundred zoom calls, I'd be using maybe <clears throat> maybe 10 to 15% of the available throughput. Mm -hmm. And additionally, some companies actually have um, throughput that's available communally. So um, this is what's advertised sometimes as burst speeds. So you'll see like, oh, Xfinity or Verizon has burst speeds up to X amount. What that means is we have this much bandwidth available, but it's not all just for you. You can use it if it's not being used by one of your neighbors, but if it's being used by one of your neighbors, it might not be available. <clears throat> and that's and that's a throughput dimension of analysis. So that's another thing too. Like when you say all data must be treated equally, are you talking about uh, data over time? Are you talking about well, to be clear, throughput? Are you talking about to be clear? Uh, I guess that is. I guess if you want to put it into a more you know, solidified standpoint, I guess the analysis and the the, the, the um, statement regarding the child I gave, it's basically just the generalized statement. Um, I think it'd be better if we're talking about interpretation, I think it'd be better the the general, not just the general public's interpretation, but also uh, politicians that oppose the repeal of net neutrality's interpretation, which are the people who basically, you know, they're the ones who make the laws, um, is, you know, if you cannot charge more for a specific, you cannot charge more or less or restrict uh, specific <sighs> services. Now, well, clear, why not? Why not? Restriction, what did it, to be clear, I'm not saying restrict certain services, um, as in, as in you can't uh, you can't ban certain sites like governments take down what government take the government takes down websites all the time. Um, you can't at the base level like when you're getting the uh, internet uh, on your laptop, they can't just block a site um, for no reason. If, I mean, obviously the government can do whatever they want. They're the government, which sure. is really kind of I don't know. But, Whatever, but, but. but they don't. But the but these companies don't do that. Like they weren't doing that before the net neutrality well, rules were were passed. And they're not doing that now. Because I remember I used to. I was trying to figure because I know it's it what happened during the Obama era. Why net neutrality was actually imposed? Um, because I'm trying to figure out exactly um, why that was again. Because I right, so let me so because I do know. And to be clear, it isn't happening. Nothing really significant is happening right now because. That would just be short-sighted by the companies because net neutrality is a hot. It was a right. hot topic, and it still is to an extent. But that, so, but that's the effect of con that's the that's the effect of competition at work. Those companies are, are competing with other companies. Yes, it is because those com those companies are competing with other companies to provide products and services over the internet, and they know that they will hurt themselves as much as they can hurt their competitors by acting badly or in bad faith towards their customers. Co companies don't want to hurt their customers, generally speaking, because the companies are the are the so source of their financial success. So, <clears throat> if a company wants to keep its customers, it needs to keep them happy. And a way to not keep them happy is to start randomly blocking their access to things that they want access to. So that's why most companies don't do that. It's not because there's a regulatory body saying you can't do that. It's because it would be bad business to do that. So, I mean, but so what, what exactly competition, like do these companies, like these, let's like, you know, Comcast, Verizon. Sure. Um, what, but it's, not Com it's not Comcast and Verizon. So Comcast and Verizon, like they don't care. They, they don't want the regulations because their, their um, bottom line will be bigger without them. But they're also fine with the regulations because they are they are deep pocketed enough to play that game. It's actually how, how exactly it's actually we, um, it's actually it's actually the companies in Silicon Valley that benefit that benefit the most from net neutrality regulations. So companies like Netflix and Google via YouTube and even Facebook yeah, I, I've heard this argument with their before, video yeah. content. Like this this these are the companies that benefit hugely. Well, from this is actually something that, I've... that rulemaking basically says you have to let this this particular traffic through and not impede it. And then they can sick the government after um, ISPs. And some of these ISPs, by the way, are pretty small operations. Like they're not all Comcast. Like if you go out into the Midwest in Nebraska, you're probably not gonna have a big ISP. You're probably gonna have a small, uh, smaller company. It could even be like a mom and pop or family business type, type of thing. And they can go after those companies. So, <clears throat> so that's why you see you know, when the, the whole brouhaha 
over net neutrality was erupting, you saw basically unanimous support for net neutrality from almost every major right. Silicon Valley company. Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, oh, to be clear, I'm not trying to, I mean, I've heard definitely heard something. They definitely benefit from it because it's basically saying these companies take up way, these companies and services take up an extreme but, amount of bandwidth. But I don't know if you and I benefit from it because right now I want to con con uh, consume content from those companies, but there might be a company that's trying to compete with them that provides a better product. And they can't even get their foot in the door because they can't afford to um, abide by the, the laws and regulations. And they can't compete with the benefit that has been bestowed upon these companies by the net neutrality regulation. Okay, wait. How, so, how so, then, so then you end up, so then you end up with, with, with a Facebook and a Google and a Netflix that can have content that not, doesn't necessarily meet their customers' expectations, and people don't have much of a choice. Just to be on the same page, as I, as I you know, remember, there was the reason that these companies did but wanted, wanted the repeal of net neutrality to not go through, uh, namely on, like Netflix and things like that, was because their content took up a lot of bandwidth, and, since, and basically the ISPs couldn't really say, you can't, um, you can't, we're going to charge more for your service because it takes up a lot more. Um, it takes yes. up a lot more bandwidth and a lot more service. Yeah. Than yeah. else. And another yeah. time he says, well, you can't do that. Well, if you have an all you can eat buffet, let's say you have an all you can eat buffet, right? Mm -hmm. You have, you have your customers there eating mm -hmm. and it's all you can eat, but nobody actually eats everything, right? People come in, they eat their fill and then they leave. What if you had somebody who, bust in a truck full of 500 pound people and they literally just ate everything you had. Would you let them back in the store the next time they came? Or would you be like, no, for you guys, we're going to charge a little more. I mean, I can see that. It, but like I no laws, no regulations, just a question of like simple human fairness. What would you do if you were the buffet owner? Well, I mean, obviously let's be clear here in this analogy, you'd obviously, you know, not let them in or charge more. Yeah, exactly. So this is this is the it's a oversimplification, but it's just saying like if I provide a service, I should be able to decide how that service is consumed, particularly if it impacts other customers who are relying on me for that service. And, yeah, but and, and and the repeal of net neutrality puts the power to make those decisions back into the companies that that provide those services directly to their customers. So why wouldn't you just charge and, so why don't you just charge more for like, so, I mean, I've also heard this argument. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if this is just me not fully comprehending it because I wondered, so why not just for, charge more per, um, for as much data as you use? Because clearly these companies are using more data, more bandwidth. Why not just charge more for that than specifically restrict these specific? Well, and that's the thing. Like, that's the thing. The, the, the regulation was so confusing that companies were doing that in some cases. Like, People are saying, "Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to pay more." Oh, you think companies to, were or weren't doing that? In certain they cases? were. Oh, they were. They definitely were. Go, yeah. go, go to a company where you can buy like a cell phone plan and look at what they offer you. They offer you twenty different plans. Yeah, at, yeah that's at, why I just don't understand why that. So they're happen. already, so they're already carving up their service into different service tiers or categories, and 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 you know, I think there's mostly nothing wrong with that. Like if you go to a car wash. You can pay for the eight dollar regular car wash, or you can go for the twenty dollar scrub your rims and and get your undercarriage washed and all of that stuff. If you want to spend the extra money, you can do that. But um, the person who wants their undercarriage wash doesn't, you know, the company's not obligated to sell it to them for the same eight dollar regular car wash that they're selling to you otherwise. Like, if you want more, well, you I mean, I mean, to be fair, were they even required to that during net neutrality? Because couldn't they just? I mean, you said cell phone companies were and still are doing that. I can't, um, I can't go out on my phone and yeah. do this podcast, look on YouTube in 4K and all that stuff. Otherwise, I'm going to run out of data. I mean, I don't understand why companies couldn't one just couldn't just do that. And if they and because the so there were rules. So there are rules around how how you can divide it up. It's not that you can't. It's not a, an absolute prohibition. It, under net neutrality, there are certain things you could and couldn't do. And, and one of them was divide content up by the source or the site from where that content was coming from. So you couldn't have like a, um, a unlimited data plan, but then exclude access to, you know, um, block out Netflix and YouTube, let's say, and then charge customers extra to be able to actually access Netflix and YouTube. 
Yeah, I mean, I see what you, I see what you're saying, but, but that's not. But that's not it. So, but that's not. That's never happened. What did happen is the the carriers went to Netflix and YouTube and said, "You guys are using a tremendous amount of bandwidth. We've got to figure out a way to shore up our infrastructure so that." We can support the amount of bandwidth that you're that you're sending our way with this high definition video content, and that's going to cost us money to upgrade our infrastructure. So we need to figure something out that works to the benefit of your customers and and you know doesn't bankrupt us. And that's when Netflix and Google were like, "Oh, government, come help us! They're trying to charge us more money." It's like, well, no, you're providing a service. And by the way, there were ways to innovate around this problem that Netflix was in particular was already pursuing. So. Um, you can you can Google this. I don't have all the details of it, but Netflix was basically already undergoing a plan to to have um, caching devices. So these are basically little mini Netflix servers that they would put in ISPs, um, central offices, or colo facilities, and and serve the content locally or regionally. So that like you know, I live in New Hampshire, Southern New Hampshire, right? So you know my colo facility or my central office in Concord, New Hampshire has got a little miniature Netflix service that has all of the content that's frequently accessed from Southern New Hampshire available locally so that they're not pulling it over the larger uh, um, pipes from, you know, wherever Netflix is headquartered, wherever their data centers happen to be. So they were already on the path to solve this problem in a way, in a way by innovating through technology. And, you know, the regulation was basically kind of an afterthought of like, oh, yeah, that would help, too. But that's not how industries grow. That's not how technology grows. Uh, innovation happens when you have a problem and you're forced to solve it and not call the go government to come bail you out. Mm -hmm. And I mean, so why were so you, I mean, I, I have another question about because you were saying I don't, I don't know if you already answered this question and I'm just I just completely forgot it. Um, but it was because uh, I asked you about. How the how the repeal of wait I'm thinking if you already did yeah I'm just gonna so because you're talking about um, how they would be able you were talking about how the repeal of net neutrality would um, help these companies bottom line were you is that how it would help their bottom line by um, the a, being able to charge Netflix versus like Netflix and YouTube more and charging more for that. Is that well, they're not, they're not doing that necessarily. Yeah, I know. What, not, what not, it does is do that right now, to be clear. Yeah, so, and I don't think they would necessarily start doing that. And in fact, those rules were, were repealed a few months ago. And, and so far, I haven't seen or heard any instances where that's well, happening. To be clear, that so what does happen is now you, don't have, now, you, now you don't have a regulatory, now you don't have a regulatory burden. And what that means is you don't have to submit your, your infrastructure, your pricing plans. You don't have to get regulatory sign off. You know, you don't have to de uh, deploy and or keep on staff a, a fleet of lawyers that are going to help make sure that you are within the boundaries of the net neutrality rules and, and all of this stuff. So this is how it helps their bottom line by reducing their cost of being able to provide that service because they don't have the cost of, of conforming to regulations anymore. Mm -hmm. So they don't have the cost of conforming to those regulations. Well, we're, we're exactly yeah, because it's it's very it's very expensive to comply with with regulation generally speaking well what exactly because those regulations weren't exactly saying i mean they were i mean yeah it's up to interpretation the quote in you know to all data is equal yeah i mean it's i don't equal. know i don't know enough i don't know i don't have enough level of detail here to to say exactly how the costs manifest themselves so i'm speaking in more of a general sense and i might be making some assumptions here but generally speaking um, you can be sure in, in, in industries that are, are experiencing deregulation or rollback uh, of re a regulatory regime that there is an instant um, benefit of not having to comply with those regulations anymore. And the, mar and the market usually proves that out. So go look at how, like, what those st the stock prices of the major players in that industry did in the months and days after um, the net neutrality rules were repealed. Yeah, that's a bit. Yeah, that's a bit. You know, that's not exactly a direct relationship because that's more yeah. how that's more how investors feel about it. But um, there is there is a real cost to regulations, and it's maybe a little less obvious in in the world of internet and telecommunications. But like the pharmaceutical and, and medical industry is a place where you can see that cost very clearly. I mean, it costs something like 
nine billion dollars to bring a new drug to market. It kind of feels like you're, it kind of feels like comparing apples to oranges a little bit there, though. Just a just a little bit because it's it's Maybe. it's like the way they would be the way they would be uh you know imposing these uh regulations is a way they're the only way or at least the way I would see the only feasible way to make money off of this would be to uh, you know as we were saying uh you know charge more for these services like. Uh, Netflix and YouTube because of the just insane amount of bandwidth that they use up, um, uh, which they obviously aren't doing. They're not doing anything, first of all, to be clear. Well, they might be charging more to Google and Netflix. What's that? They might be charging more to Google and Netflix. They should, in fact. Yeah, I mean, I if, mean if Netflix is is like, oh, we need to use we need to use you know, twenty petabytes of data this month instead of just ten, then the companies that that they buy their internet service from should charge them more and but same with google like, and, and google like, responds to that by the way by saying well we'll just we'll just create our own internet service but it kind of isn't in, I, I don't know, own fiber like, backbone that kind of like so, comes back to the point of where like why i i mean why couldn't have they just said okay 10 petabytes of data cost this much 25 petabytes of data cost this much rather than just you are youtube therefore we're going to charge you more and i think i mean it's not like again they were doing that with cell phones i don't know if i'm Coming back to talk it, topic yeah. that I'm like a broken record on, and I'm and I'm just too stupid that I did. I no. didn't follow the point that it, was made. I told you it, it's very it's very complicated. Yeah, um, and there's a, and there's a lot and there's a lot to understanding it, and that's why like that's another thing that annoyed me about the whole debate is it was trying to be boiled down into very um, that is something low, I didn't very like low resolution sound bites. Um, yeah, some, and yeah. internet memes and like there's no way you can get it you can get your brain around a topic this complicated by reading a few internet memes that's why i just i just generally despise um like marketing around like politics and things like that whenever i see an ad on my phone for a politician i just say this is such bullshit oh my god i mean it's it's never that black and white i but, I, I mean there's a reason for it because th most people don't care enough about yeah, it nor do they to, have time to invest to invest the time and energy into understanding it and that's and that's okay I just know, there are a lot of topics in the world that i don't i don't choose to spend my time or energy investing into yeah. like getting getting a greater understanding and sometimes it's helpful to have a very low resolution a uh, high level snapshot of like, here's what people in this industry say or whatever. Yeah. But to be but, fair, that's like what's sponsored by, and I feel like people don't, some people don't have that separation. They see this ad and they're like, okay, this is what's happening. And they don't recognize that there's someone. And it's like, it's, I, I feel yeah. like it's this effect of these stupid freaking sheeple. They know what they're, but, and when they're not really acknowledging the intelligence of people. Um, but I mean, it's not like I, I have, I, I mean, I have seen, I, I hate anecdotal claims. But I can I see people saying these like just regurgitating these things that these ads say and that these these yeah. slogans that they do them. I've seen it on the news. <laughs> the the, tri the the only way I saw it on Fox News. It's the first yeah. word that someone that wasn't you or um my dad has said in like twenty minutes. Yeah. Hey, how long is this going to, by the way, guys? Six. Uh, like six. six. Is the oh, okay. Video. All right. Maybe we should uh, move off from this topic. But sure. I, no, well, I have a question about yeah. about libertarianism. See, I don't, I don't have a strong opinion either way, really. Mm -hmm. Most most things I lean libertarian, but there's one thing that I've like thought about for a while. I haven't really found an answer, but that doesn't mean I think I'm right. I just like so. It seems like a lot of libertarianism is based in the fact that humans okay. are smart, which I don't think they are. Most of them. Okay. So like. If you had a business that was, uh, I don't know, taking advantage of minorities and, um, like, I don't know, owning sweatshops, people are too stupid to look up to see if they're running sweatshops. Yeah. And, like, so, go for the competition. Quote what's wrong with sweatshops? Well, like, let's say they, they have a sweatshop, and then they come into town, and these people start so, to someone's rely gonna on edit that out. Someone's going to no. edit that out and just, like... Just like keep that as something to hold again. What's wrong with sweatshops? <laughs> with I mean, I'm, 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 so I'm, no. I'm, I'm being purposely contrarian here, but well, tell me what's wrong yeah, with sweatshops. Yeah, well, I, I think in my mind, it's like, well, sweatshops will show up in a small, I don't know, Mexican village or. Mm -hmm. Dylan, you're not actually saying what's wrong with them. You're just South American. Where they will come up. No, I'm not. What? I didn't, you didn't even let me finish my sentence. <laughs> okay, go, go, go. And then, um, and then, uh, People start to depend on them. It's like the Walmart scenario where Walmart show up in small towns and yeah. then eventually they leave because they don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that's what's wrong with them is that people start to depend on these sweatshops and then they leave and then their what, lives are. What would the people in the sweatshops be doing if they weren't working in the sweatshop? Yeah, uh, I guess doing nothing. Well, okay, wait, 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 wait. That's kind of, I feel like you just kind of described the point of the reason. And I'm not saying that the that the min, we should have a minimum wage. I'm just saying you kind of described the reason the government imposes a minimum wage. I'm not saying we should have it. Yeah. I'm just saying you kind of just described that exact reason. Yeah, they would be doing nothing. But these companies have so much money. And yes, yes, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor is still, is still stealing. Um, but I think it's, but to be clear, I think st stealing to a point, and it is stealing to say you have to pay this much or you have to pay taxes. It is stealing. It, it literally, I mean, it's like, but it's like, well, stealing is unlawful. It's like, screw off. Yeah. So if the government murders someone, it's still murder. I don't care if it's the law or not. But I, I would say that it's stealing to a point and to such a small extent on the percentage wise for this company. And it, if it helps this many people, um, uh, without like, and you know, safety regulations as well. Um, and I, I think safety regulations is, is less of a good argument because the co company je companies generally want to keep their citizen, their employees alive so they can work. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I think that's the, the point kind of, of a minimum wage and just very basic regulations on these things. And I, I also, uh, and yeah, I, 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 I agree with Dylan's but, point. But a minimum but, wage is, is very hostile to, to low-skilled workers who may not be able to find an opportunity that's better than a menial manufacturing job. All right, I have a question for you, too. Wait, 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 wait. How, how do you, what do you mean by that? What do I mean by like, like that someone that has you know, like someone has low because skill. you because you because you price them out because you're you're setting up you're setting a a floor to the price for labor that's higher than what their ability is to provide value to a company that would hire them so they just don't get hired. Okay, I mean, but then so all right, okay, okay, I guess I see what you're saying there. So you're so is out is you're implying that if we if we you know for example like get rid of the minimum wage. Uh, unemployment rates will, as I mean, will unemployment well, rates they will obviously go down. No, they won't because you still have a welfare state. So people can still make a lot more money by collecting benefits from the government than they can by working. So if there's a welfare state and you abolish a minimum wage, it's not going to do much, I don't think. Here's, here's another question I have. I think, so I, I understand why the minimum wage, for the most part, is pretty stupid. Well, let but, me, well, go ahead, sorry. But uh, so my mom doesn't seem to get this. She's like, okay. she looks on Facebook and sees people working at Disney World, like old people who are like being homeless. And she doesn't understand how Disney can get away with that. And I think, like, I don't have the word, I don't, like, uh, I don't think I have the knowledge of how to explain it, like, simply. So how would you explain it to her? Uh, well, let me ask you this. I, okay. You guys, are you homes? Are you homeschooled too, Dylan? Yeah, well, I go to a Sudbury school. Yeah, you go to, Sudbury. Go, to Sudbury. So you go to Sudbury schools. Okay. Um, if you got, if one of, if one or both of you could have an opportunity to do an apprenticeship in your in the field of your dream. So I know Neil, you said you want to be a dietitian. I don't know what you want to be when you grow up, or if you even know yet, Dylan, but. Let's say you just had an opportunity to, to do an apprenticeship where you could learn everything there is to learn about the thing that you want to do with your life or the thing that you think you want to do at least at this moment with your life. But the only catch is you'd have to work for free. Would you do it? I mean, no. yeah. No, you wouldn't do it wait, because wait, it's illegal. We, well, it's an apprenticeship. No. It's, it's doesn't like, matter. It doesn't matter. An internship, basically. An yeah. internship, I mean, and how the, you have to pay interns. In uh, so I, my company's in Massachusetts, in the state of Massachusetts, you have to pay interns. You're not. You're not allowed. You're not there allowed. Are to, loopholes for internships, and uh, I know yeah. that because you can't. Sure. Yeah, because I mean, it's basic. I mean, it is unpaid labor. You don't have to. Yeah. Mean, you, can, you can. You can give them certain things. But if I got, I mean, to be clear, like when I hear an apprenticeship, and yeah, you kind of describe, and I feel like yeah, you did kind of describe an internship, and it's, I guess I would take that if I, yeah, if, so, I wouldn't take that as a long term thing because I can't. No, nobody would, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to because you would learn enough skills to become employable. Eventually, you would know enough about whatever the thing is you're doing for free that you'd be worth money to somebody. And they'd want to pay you. Well, isn't that just like the point of going to internship and then quitting? What's that? Isn't that the point of doing an internship or an apprenticeship and then stopping it? I mean, yeah. No, they, that's yeah. exactly the point. 
yeah so then but wait. but that opportunity only exists if you're a college student and you happen to live in a state where you can still have a free apprentice uh, free apprentice or internship most places you have you have to pay somebody to be an apprentice or an intern yeah. i see so, what you're saying so that really limits the field because the company you know companies have limited resources they have to decide how to allocate capital how to how to spend the, the money that they have in their bank right um, and they want to be able to develop um, the future labor force, but they have limited resources to do that. So the fact that they can't do that for free or for very little money right now <clears throat> uh, means that they can't do that for very many people. And that's another thing that perpetuates this whole college myth. It's like, well, you have to go to college to be successful. Well, yeah, of course you do, because there's no opportunities you know, with free to minimum financial barrier to gain marketable skills otherwise. It's really hard for you guys. You, I mean, I don't know how old you guys are, but I'm gonna assume none of you is over the age of 18. It's yeah. really hard for somebody under the age of 18 to get a job of any kind these days. And the reason why it's really hard is not because the economy is bad. It's child labor laws. It's, it's because of child labor laws and it's because of minimum wage laws. It's because the value that you can offer to a company is right now, if you don't know anything about a particular job, lower than what the minimum wage is. So nobody can start you at $4 an hour and teach you enough to earn $7 an hour out of your own, i.e. have enough economic output in the job that you're doing to earn that much money. Because there's a law that says the minimum you can pay somebody is $7.25 or whatever it is. And people want to make that like $15 an hour. A $15 an hour minimum wage would be disastrous. To okay, people. yeah, I agree there. I it think- It'd be disastrous. Yeah, to be clear, uh, I don't I don't support raising the minimum wage um, because it's just ridiculous. If you raise the minimum wage, if you raise the entire minimum wage, it'll just cause inflation and and it's just ridiculous. But I, I guess I still I still don't see because I feel like that apprenticeship, I feel like it's kind of glorifying certain things that don't, I guess, require apprenticeships or anything like that. I mean, OK. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't apply to the sweatshop example that we started with, I think is what you're trying to say. Like, there's a lot of jobs that... You don't apprentice in sewing a, a, a shirt together so you can give it to the next person on the line. No, but you might learn how factory work operates. You might be you able to... You need to learn how factory work operates to operate in a... Like, very basic... Give to that. I mean, isn't that... I mean... Yeah, you start... Yeah, it starts off pretty basic, but you can learn a lot. You can learn a lot because there's a flow to the entire manufacturing floor. So you can you can observe how materials move from one station to the next, what happens to them, what are the things that slow slow things down, what are the things that are faster, what are the things that make the, the factory as, as an entire operating unit more productive. Like there's tons to observe and learn in a factory environment. And, bef and if you are somebody that's motivated to observe and learn those things, you're going to be a floor supervisor before long, making a lot more than minimum wage. And you might even move into an engineering or a consultancy uh, phase after that. So what would like... So there's no such thing as a job that there's no skills that you can learn that are transferable to... Well, I mean, yeah. In terms of upward mobility. I truly believe that. You can turn anything into something more if you go about it the right way. Okay. Um, so... Okay, so Dylan, you just Dylan just sent a thing in the chat saying that he has to leave at five thirty. So do you want to? Okay. Do you want to like? Is there anything you want to talk about, Dylan? Well, you guys, quick? you guys, well, uh, yeah, I just had to leave for rush and dinner. We we kind of we kind of uh we kind of derailed your sweatshop thing, and I wanted to hear the rest. Yeah, of I want to hear what you have to say more because we wanna, can talk all yeah, day after you're yeah, gone. But. I want I wanted to hear more about that. Like, so your argument is basically that sweatshops aren't that bad of a thing. No, because it's voluntary. So anything that's voluntary, if if it's mm -hmm. if it's my best choice out of a range of options I have for my life, mm -hmm. then it's it shouldn't be up to a government body or some guy with a funny hat right. to say that choice is wrong for you. I'm going to make a law that says you're not allowed to make that choice. So I'm curious. My work this. output is is it, so if I own my body, I own the output of the work that that body performs. I should mm -hmm. be able to um, do what I want with that work output from a range of giving it away for free to selling it to the highest bidder. Mm -hmm. And the minute, so what a minimum wage is, is it's somebody 
outside of me and the person I'm negotiating with coming in and saying, you can't sell the product of your own work for that price. Mm-hmm. Right. So like, let's say you're like crafting things and selling them on Etsy and you decide you want to sell as many as you, as you can to get you to, to get um, recognition. Let's say you're an artist and you just want to get your name out there. You want to become well-known. That's your main motivation. You don't care if you lose a little bit of money or don't make much money on every piece that you sell. So you mm-hmm. sell them at the minimum possible price, 50 cents a piece or a dollar a piece, let's say. Now, a minimum wage is akin to somebody coming and saying it's illegal for you to sell your, your work for a dollar a piece because you can't make a living off a dollar a piece. You have to sell them for $10 a piece or $5 a piece. Well, that ruins your original goal, which was to get as many pieces out in the wild as you can to build name recognition and doesn't actually help you because <clears throat> although it's a living wage, it's the bare minimum you need to survive and you're never going to be able to get on the ramp to launch yourself upwards if you don't get the name recognition. Mm-hmm. So this is, this is kind of like the dynamic of like, if, if, if I own the product of my own work, <clears throat> I should be able to sell it at whatever price I see fit, whether that's giving it away to somebody for free or selling it for a hundred dollars. I really like And that. when you go, and when you go in, you know, offer employment to an employer, you're selling your work product to that employer. <clears throat> and a minimum wage is the government telling you what price you're allowed to sell that work for. And I just think that's wrong. Uh, I think that, I think that's really interesting. Um, I was going to ask. Uh, oh, yeah, I, like- I have a I have a question. So, mm-hmm. what would you say, like in your mind, as someone who is part of like kind of I don't know what, what to call it, like a Walmart scam where Walmart comes in and gives people a job and then they leave and then these people have no jobs. Like, so what would you say to someone in that situation, like how to? Had to change it around because I try and talk to my mom about this stuff, and she's like, "So you would just say that they're all like stupid?" I'm like, "Oh, not really." So no. what? What would you say? So, so people get mad with Walmart because they outcompete a lot of smaller businesses. Yes, that's what ends up happening. So Walmart, um, the the rub against Walmart is there. You know, there's a Walmart coming to town. You might have a small uh, regional you know, grocery chain or department store, or, um, you know, maybe it's even smaller. Maybe it's like the general store or something like that. <clears throat> and these places typically have much higher prices than Walmart does. So mm-hmm. products are much more expensive to buy. They typically have very limited um, selection. So there isn't the variety of things that people need. Um, and they end up, they end up um, eventually sometimes being driven out of business, or at least it impacts their business negatively when Walmart shows up. So the problem that's being identified is Walmart is out competing them for business. So if I have, you know, dollars in my pocket, my dollars go further at Walmart than they do at the general store because the general store is more expensive and they have less of the things I need. Mm-hmm. So the problem that everybody's identifying is the plight of the small business owner, right? Small business owner can't compete <clears throat> because they don't have the buying power, the size or breadth of Walmart. So they end up getting hurt by that. And that's true. But that happens all the time. Like that is being in business in the United States or in any country really that that has, you know, some level of capitalism at play is you can get out, out competed by your competitors. You have to figure out how to compete with them. Now, some small businesses have figured out the way you compete with them is be, by becoming sort of a um, destination brand. Like, oh, we are the, you know, we are the farm, farm to table farmer's market. You know, our stuff is the most pure, most organic. It's not what you're going to find in the grocery store. And there is, a, there is a segment of the consumer public who, who are socially conscious and want to buy things from the small shop and, and buy organic and all of this stuff. Um, and they're going to choose to spend more money at the small store <clears throat> than, than just save money and go for the, you know, the um, big box Walmart experience. And the small businesses that have figured out this dynamic are doing pretty well still, even when Walmart comes to town. Businesses that haven't figured that out are, are hurting. They're suffering from that. But that's literally so like when Walmart comes to town, <clears throat> focusing on one little thing that happens to this one little store over here, when there's an economic impact that reverberates throughout the community community is just being very, very myopic. And it makes you blind to other effects that it has. For instance, if you are in a very poor impoverished community and access to basic goods 
is really difficult because you don't have something like a Walmart where you can cheaply and safely buy food products, clothes for your children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Walmart is, is so much cheaper than its competitors that it actually ends up being a net benefit. It's almost like a de facto welfare benefit to people who are below the po poverty line because um, it allows them to have access to products they wouldn't otherwise have access to. And that's an economic benefit. And nobody talks about that. Nobody says, hooray, Walmart's coming to town. Now the poor people have a place where they can buy the same stuff that we were buying at Sears and, and these high-end stores. Mm -hmm. Nobody says that. That, that e e economic effect is ignored. And by the way, the other weird thing about Walmart is they're singled out amongst a lot of businesses that have the same business model. So one of the common competitors is Target. It's like red store versus blue store. Walmart comes to town, they're terrible and evil, and they, they pay slave wages, and they drive people out of business, but when Target comes to town, Target is very, <clears throat> somehow has managed to market themselves as much more upscale, so nobody has bad feelings about Target coming to town. So Target mm -hmm. comes to town, and it's a great thing, and it's wonderful, and oh, now I can go and buy my kids all the Cat and Jack clothes, and blah, blah, blah. Um, so there's also a dynamic of Walmart just has this, um, this reputation as being mm -hmm. an evil corporation that precedes them and, and creates an unfair bias in people's minds right from the get-go. So can I just circle uh, in? Uh, Neil, for, uh, I think I'll just, I'll get going just before you guys get into anything more. All, All right. right. Bye, Dylan. All right. Thank you for, hey, thank hey, you for coming on. It was yeah, nice meeting the, you. Nice meeting you too. Thanks for the questions. It was sure. awesome. Bye, Dylan. Right. Peace out. Right. So I just want to quickly Later. circle back to one thing that uh, I mentioned, Dylan mentioned earlier about like you like inherently like expect the uh, libertarians I feel like inherently expect the consumer to be well informed or at least have the time yeah. to be informed. Everybody is going to act in rational self interest. In yeah, but but to be clear, they to don't. Be clear I, that, I would I, I need to de to say that that is inherently an assumption or a bad thing. I need to demonstrate why that would uh you know an example that would come into effect and that would be you know bad. If you yeah. Say. So I mean I would so it's like. So I don't know. I, I'm assuming. Do you believe in climate change? <laughs> do I believe in climate change? Yes. yes. I believe the climate is changing. Do you believe that humans are the uh, are are contributing to that? I believe there's a lot of evidence to that case, and that there is some evidence to the other case. But mostly, I have skept skepticism that evidence to the contrary of that is allowed to see the light of day in the current political climate. Okay. So I think there. I think. It, that is a fancy way of saying, I think that if you're a scientist that finds data that contradicts that climate change is real and human made, it's pretty hard to have your voice heard in the current political climate because the science around it has been so politicized. So I think it's pretty, so I suspect it's true, but I also suspect that if it turned out not to be true, that's a message that it, we're not going to really hear. Yeah, I mean, I guess I can understand that to a, a, a certain extent. So I, I have a pretty big grain of skept skepticism because of that. Yeah, I guess I can understand that, but it's also like a lot of, some of the mainstream media can be skeptical of climate change um, to an extent. I mean, it's not like, I'm not saying the Republican Party, I'm not trying to completely blank the Republican Party as climate change isn't real, because that's not true at all. Mm -hmm. It's just that they tend to, I feel like, be more skeptical towards that and therefore, yeah. and to be clear, they do have the, when people, I, I really hate it when people are trying to paint the Republican Party in right now um, as the, like, the minority, because let's be clear here, they have the majority in all state governments, or not all state governments, they, the, the majority of state governments, uh, they hold the power, they hold the power in the presidency, the Senate, and the House, mm -hmm. and, the, and the judicial branch, legislative branch, and executive branch, well, they all hold the power. Well, well, well that is true. If you look at the social aspect of it, I mean, yeah, socially, in current, in current, well, in the current political climate, the social status and aspect is is a very big deal since the invention of the internet. Because everything anyone does, they're not going to get away with it so easily the way you could twenty years ago. So, well, the fact that Repu like the Republican Party holds the majority like in office and stuff like that, the majority of America right now. The, of the of like the actual verbally speaking and like typing out and all the keyboard warrior warriors and stuff are like democratic socialist That's meaning, yeah but i mean you also have to Donald see Trump. Trump. And, understand that there is a there's a strong counterculture 
um, there is a strong right wing counterculture. Um, yeah, there is, but it's also drowned out by all of the people who strongly disagree with that. And if you if you were to if you were to not know anything about Earth's culture, and you were to come to Earth, and you're literally locked in a in a basement with nothing around you except for a computer, and the computer can only go on Facebook, you'd think the entire world, based off of the majority of Facebook, like that that right wing people were like a tiny minority of made up of like redneck uncles. But and if you went on, but to, I mean, if you went on a place like YouTube, I mean, yeah, you had the. If quote. you went on a place like YouTube, you'd find. Largely the same thing, but also YouTube isn't really a, a oh. fair example because YouTube is content creators who, for the most part, are not just regular people. Like, there are ways... No, no, no. Well, not even content creation. It's what's supported by, like, content. Like, what, what, is, more, what is more popular uh, content on YouTube? And if you actually, like, look at, the, at what these view statistics are, like dislike ratios and subscriptions, you can see that these conservative counterculture channels are the... Quote, SJ anti SJW YouTubers, whatever the hell you want to call them, they have on average way more subscribers, w better like to dislike ratio, uh, way more. Views Where's your source for that though? What is that? Where's your source for that? Uh, I can't actually provide a scientific source for that because there are no surveys done on that. I mean, uh, but where did where did you learn that information then? So I wanted to figure out like where these actually. So I went on all these popular. SJW or anti I don't remember the channels, but and I just looked at what who they were responding to, and every single one, like for example, this the, like I'll use an example. So you know the the um what was that MTV news? I know that people were talking about that for a while. The where's Chrome? I have so many tabs open. Okay, the MTV uh news thing that became quote SJW or whatever. Uh, I, I hate using the term social just word because I feel like it's just used to shut people down. Well, say um, keyboard warrior then. That's what yeah, I'll say keyboard name. warrior. Um, so um, uh, I, I went because I know there were, there were a lot of responses to that. And I don't know, some, some woman named Fran or whatever. I don't know. Uh, but I mean, they really did not, as far as I know, I mean, they have like, I think quite a few subscribers on the YouTube channel. But um, the actual like videos that were about that yeah they're like coming at like six thousand views one th i mean six oh wait no that was wait that was a while ago um but i think that also just goes to show and then the like to dislike ratio is like not that if you look at the like dislike ratio for your for that average channel and any uh, and this and these videos that they're responding to they are pretty i mean insane and you look like some of the bigger ones like lacy green or like uh, Anita Sarkeesian, and you have the same thing. You have like, been around forever. And so it's support. more likes and less dislikes, or even, or like, what do you mean? Like more dislikes than likes, but more so the intention that they're uh, getting, and how it's a lot easier to grow and promote a a quote anti okay keyboard warrior uh, channel than it is to grow one that is pro or even towards. <laughs> well, I that. think that's because of the. But I think the reasoning for that is proves my point though. Like the the amount of people in the world who are that is why things like that have such a wide audience because people are like, oh, finally something that isn't like a keyboard warrior. Because when you have something that's like when the majority of things feel some way about something and all of them have like a decent amount of followers, but that's just the general consensus. When something disagrees, it's going to have more because it's one in. A flock of like yeah i mean i will agree that youtube generally is more of a counterculture thing because you do see like and that's kind of a stupid thing to say when you take it at face value um but if you look at the actual youtube community like and I'm not, what i mean by that is because the biggest channels the ones that get the most views i'm not talking about pewdiepie i'm not talking about logan or jake paul yeah. it's the ones that are based off of talk shows and to be fair the liberal talk shows because those are the ones that are actually really popular you mean the only ones <laughs> For the most part, the only ones to be clear, the, just the only ones full stop. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's I think it's also interesting, though, not to like completely go off. of. But I was when you speak about the top like talk shows thing, and I'm just going to go off of this really quick because <laughs> I haven't spoken much today. I think it's really interesting how talk show YouTube videos work and like just talk shows in general, because you essentially have two choices now, if you're someone who like hosts a talk show and like, you're the person coming up with the material, you can either be super leftist and 
well, not necessarily late, but like be like, uh, I think who is it? Jimmy Kimmel or whatever, who like, just like compl- not Jimmy Kimmel. It's uh one of the, one of them. Is it Jimmy Kimmel? Whichever one is like always does his, goes out and does this little spotlight thing where like he talks and complains about Donald Trump. That's Jimmy Kimmel. And the- no, that's all of that's all. That is all. Of well, that, well, they all, they all monologue about call that. everyone. Well, they can either, they can either do that or they can completely stay out of politics and just do like the Jimmy Fallon thing where they just be like ridiculously out there because that's like, those are your two options. I have more respect for the Jimmy Fallon. Exactly. Because that's, but the problem is as you like, as you've seen recently, Jim, like you don't see Jimmy Fallon stuff as much because people don't want to see that. People want to see a confirmation of their own bias. People want to see their confidence. Like the target audience for a late night talk show is like, People between like people who are watching YouTube videos who are like 22 or whatever, like just out of college, like yeah, man, or people who are like in their like late 40s to like 70s who are like all very very de- democratic and like I I voted for her or whatever and like not my president and they want to hear a confirmation of their own biases because that's the target audience and people like Jimmy Kimmel. Well, like, I don't even care if, like, that's 100% what he believes. People but I guarantee you, no one that once, it's like, oh, everyone thinks this is, like, great. I'll just continue people to do like this. People like to enter, enter into, like, just an, like, part of my French here. People like just like to enter, in, enter into an intellectual circle jerk, and they don't want to look at anything else. Because all they want to do is sit there and, like, support their own confirmation bias. I can understand that because it's a lot more comfortable. And, and but I feel like that happens with all, like, I feel like the anti a keyboard warrior community all like i feel like sometimes they accuse it about that but i feel like it's just as valid criticism for that side too um just because and you see and yeah i mean to be fair like the, if you want to actually just look if you want to look at the numbers and nothing else like the most popular channels and on youtube and the ones that get on trending and the ones that have the most views are the ones that just talk to host but when, when i'm talking about the youtube community uh, I'm not generally talking about. Uh, not general. I'm not generally talking about the uh, the uh, the like the TV ho- show hosts who have their YouTube channels and just post random clips from their uh, TV shows. I'm yeah. talking about the you know the actual YouTubers who sit there yeah. and make a video on YouTube for the sake of making a video on YouTube. Yeah. And yeah, but I mean, I think that we need to stop it. I feel like there's. A, a lack of like I'm, I'm look yes yeah, socially we're definitely more liberal i think well so here's something to think about that you can you can interpret two ways so look at the me too movement yeah and if you look at the me too movement and you look at like harvey weinstein and all these things like all of these horrible like people who've done horrible things and i'm not going to get into the politics of like me too and like all that because frankly i don't really care like it's whatever <clears throat> but yeah. the thing that the thing that's interesting to think about is Movie companies and TV shows aren't firing these people because they did something wrong. They're firing these people because they look like they're like they look in a bad light when like in this day and age, if they have someone who did like was part of was associated with that on the wrong side of it. So they look bad. And that's why like people get fired. Like in the new Predator movie, it's kind of ironic. There was a someone accused of like something related to me too i'm not sure of the details but basically half of the cast is boycotting that actor for being in the movie that they were in and making money off of i feel like getting accused of rape is starting to get almost as bad as like being convicted of rape like socially but even then that's not necessarily what i mean i'm just saying so you have people you have these celebrities who go into movies with these people who are part of like sexual assault cases aware that they are part of sexual assault cases do it because you want to make money and then once you've made your money take a step back and try and boycott the thing you are part of because you know because now you have a moral issue with it so that you can a look like a hero b feel good about yourself morally and c you got your money you don't have an obligation for anything now Mm -hmm. you have that if you have that pattern, Jim Carrey with the kick-ass movie, when he was in, he was in that for the second one, he boycotted the movie because his character used gun violent, like guns and he didn't believe in gun violence, but you, you cannot morally get away with doing that 
Because you were still in. If you have a moral like problem with guns, fine, that's your decision. But you, you can't. The movie. He took a check and then he said, "I'm boycotting this movie." <laughs> exactly. That's, like, yeah, that's bullshit. Like, yeah, you can't take that, the money and then donate the money. That's, to a, that's a bad example. Gun violence charity. Yeah. Donate the yeah. Donate the money to a ch- like uh, an organization that wants to stop gun violence or something. I, I I generally don't like these blanket term things. Stop rape. Okay, yeah. wow, no shit. Like, well, yeah, we like, against murder. Wow. Well, yeah, I mean, you know it's illegal to kill to kill yourself in, like, everywhere. What did you say? It's illegal to kill yourself. Like That's ridiculous. Things yeah. like that, like, it's just stupid things. People don't, like, un- goals that don't have a real goal. It's just kind of like, we want to go in this direction. Let's let's say we're going in this direction so we can feel good about ourselves, but we don't, like, that's not really a, a it's not a definable direction that you can actually go into. But anyways, as like, I wanted to rant about that because I haven't done enough ranting this show. So anyways, we have like, how, what time do we have to be off of? Six? Yes, six. 546 right now. Okay, so we have 14 minutes to finish this up. Yeah, I think we can, yeah, we can definitely manage yeah. that. I don't even know what the question was supposed to be at the beginning of the, those rants. So. I have no idea. We went, well, we went, we went, we went, it started with like something, something about libertarianism, and then we went to like conservative and liberal. Well, um, like like accounts in YouTube and all of this stuff, which I don't know. Too I much think about, but. morally, the thing that if you are just going to look at things objectively and just look at all the facts, I think if some if people were completely like just logical i think most people would probably fall into a libertarian category politically because something that happens quite often in the libertarian community is a lot of like because it's a very widespread thing and open for discussion a lot of libertarians hate each other like there's this meme that's like i don't get along with them as well as like democrats and republicans or democrats and libertarians or republicans and libertarians or libertarians and other libertarians (laughs) There is, it's not a clear defined thing other than like freedom is pretty much the underlying. It's a really bad political philosophy. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> it's a good philosophy, but it's bad politics. Right. Um, it is not, it's not something that can win votes because you have nothing to offer anybody. What you're basically saying, like my conception of libertarianism is I don't know what's best for you. And I maybe don't know what's best for me either but I'm at least willing to be saddled with the responsibility of making decisions in my own best interest. So, Um, and, and and with that at its core, you know, the, the political philosophy, most, you know, the major two parties in the United States, Republicans and Democrats, you know, in some small areas, they, they adhere to that core philosophy, but by and large, they mostly say, no, we know what's best for the people the people of the country and we are going to fight to enforce our vision of what's best for everyone. Um, And that's why, and that's why, and when you do that, by the way, when you decide, you know, what's best for everybody, you're going to find people who are like, yeah, that sounds really good. Yeah. Yeah. Call free college is what's best for everybody. I want free college. That sounds good. Sign me up. Well, do you have things to offer people when you say, I don't know what's best for you. So I really can't offer you anything. You have nothing to offer. Other than the freedom to choose, I think more importantly, you have some people, to offer people that will that yeah, I think more importantly, you don't have anything to offer the lobbying groups that will sponsor you. Yeah, exactly. you don't have anything to offer the lobbying groups. You, you know, if you are if you are a very dogmatic libertarian, you can't you basically can't be bought. Um, and, and even your own constituency, unless they're people who are principled, like free, free freedom of association, freedom of speech, you know, freedom people. Um, they're not necessarily going to like that either because, you know, when people are saddled with a ton of debt and they don't know what they're, what's going to happen, you know, in the future and somebody says, hey, I'm going to pay off all your college loans. Well, that sounds a lot better than the person who says, I don't know what's best for you, but you better take responsibility for yourself. And, and, and if you do that, I'll leave you alone. Yeah. Like, that's not exactly a, a winning political argument. Look, that's, I, why, okay. that's why it's hard for that that movement to make that's why uh ron paul vowed never to run in a libertarian party ever again like under that he always runs as a republican because right well and really what he's doing there is putting on he's putting on a costume in order to get in in order to advance those ideas yeah well he's not even trying to win an election he's just trying to make those ideas part of the public discourse yeah and in that he's pretty he's been pretty successful although 
I so so really quick because I know we're probably that yeah, we're ending soon. Um, mm-hmm. so I move in, I guess opening closing statements after this maybe. But so I just had so two really quick two more questions really quick. So uh, the first one uh, being uh, more on because I was trying to make I was trying to make this point earlier when uh, more, again on what Dylan's point was about how you know generally the consumer isn't doesn't have the time or the will to be uh, well informed on a certain topic. And so therefore, if they're, so, I mean, I, I don't understand. So if and the reason I was bringing up climate change earlier um, was to try to, was try to branch into what I'm trying to say. That's now. what we started talking about climate change. Yeah, yeah that's the, right. The reason, the reason I brought that up uh, was because it was, if a, if a company is doing something um, like, for example, uh, doing these horrible things to harm the environment, polluting the oceans, or let's say, um, uh, doing things um, overseas that are quote questionable. I mean, I, I'm sure uh, if I, I want to give like a, I guess of a hard example, the reason I asked about climate change is because that's an easy example that I can give. Sure. Yeah. Um, which is I'll, I'll use that one. Uh, climate change is doing horrible things to harm the climate. Forget harming the climate. Um, just uh, harming the environment in general, like polluting the oceans. It's well, I mean shouldn't we be able to have like yeah the consumer can try to go for a competitor's goods but it also kind of but i mean i still think that they could pretty easily try to get rid of competition and yeah i just don't i I, feel something i i see like you know uh issue it's like how would if there are no regulations or i don't know exactly how many regulations are but the problem is how do you regulate it like we like we're still learning what it is right like, uh-huh. like, like, so for like environmental issues mm-hmm. in general, um, in a lot of areas, we're still in the process of learning what's good and what's bad and trying to react to that. And part of the problem with like trying to do this by governing. <clears throat> so if you do it through government edict, first of all, government is supposed to be deliberative, i.e. slow. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is slow in a lot of ways. It's slow to react. Yeah. Laws usually get made long after they were needed, right? Um, mm-hmm. And they may not be relevant anymore. And and the problem with with a lot of this is, like, awareness comes faster than the government can react can react a lot of the time. And when the government does react, they do so in a way that is um, not always it, it it very rarely directly addresses the problem it's trying to address. And it very frequently creates about a dozen um, problems that didn't exist before they entered into the sphere to try and solve the problem. So it's like if you had like if you were like trying to solve a problem and you have a drunk uncle, right, who just who just like stumbles into the room every time there's a problem and tries to offer a solution, but he ends up just throwing up on the ground and like creating a mess and and like not really actually solving your problem or directly addressing it, but causing a bunch of like, you know, uncom- discomfort and awkwardness, you probably wouldn't invite him over to problem solve very much anymore. But in this analogy, government is the drunk uncle, right? It's, it's not equipped to deal with the intricacies of the problems. And I'm not saying that the market is necessarily great at it every time either. Like obviously there's a profit motive and the profit motive might go against um, being envir- environmentally sound, let's say. But at the same time, there's also um, the internet now, and people know when companies aren't behaving, and, and a lot of companies are without, without any laws or regulations forcing them to do so, deciding to become more responsible. There's a lot of companies that are saying, hey, you know what, we're going to cut dyes out of our food. Like um, There's a big thing. Uh, the company General Mills that makes like all the breakfast cereals. And believe me, these breakfast cereals are not the greatest things in the world. But one thing that they did was they realized that people don't like artificial um, <clears throat> ingredients added into their food or, you know, dyes and things like that. So they they went through an effort to remove all of that stuff from all of their products. And they said, hey, we're going to make a commitment by, you know, this this time, all of this stuff will be removed from our products and replaced with a natural ingredient. Does that mean that they're now a great healthy product? No, not necessarily, but that's an example of a company. Nobody told them to do that. They were doing that as a response to their customers desiring them to do something like that so that they can maintain relevance in a marketplace that takes into account factors of 
whether or not it's healthy, whether or not it's environmentally sound, et cetera. I work for a technology company. My technology, <clears throat> my company also um, has a big um, part of it that is in the world of physical manufacturing. We print, we print on things. We, we make product, uh, custom products for people. We have a, a, um, a person who's an executive of the company whose who's, um, responsibility is like being environmentally and socially responsible as a, as a company and developing, crafting, and executing a strategy that allows us to remain profitable um, while driving down environmental impact uh, that we have as a company. Like that position in my company didn't exist a few years ago, and it doesn't exist today because a government body said, we're going to pass a law that says every company has to have a corporate, you know, social or environmental responsibility officer. We did it because we have a lot of people in our company that care about the environment and want to, you know, make, you know, leave as little impact slash maybe even make a positive impact socially and environmentally um, along with, you know, selling the products that we sell to our customers every day. So that, that to me is a more effective way of dealing with the problem of, of environmental concerns or climate change. Um, and it's more flexible because if facts change on the ground, a company can more easily change something that they did themselves than the government can change a law. Changing a law is even harder than passing a law and even slower. So once the law is in place, if the facts on the ground change, you're probably gonna be waiting for a while before the laws and regulations catch up to that change. Okay. And, all right, so we do probably have to go like this. Okay. Right. So one last, this is just a blanket state, a question. That's so. What do you think the role of government should be, if any? Because you said if you're walking a tight open, yeah, and you're falling on one side of the plate, it'd be anarchism, and obviously the role of the government would be uh, not existing. <laughs> so I, I think I think basic self defense and protection is a, is a valid role of the government. If there is any valid role of the government, it would be that. Okay. All right, so I guess maybe we should move into closing statements. Uh, who wants to start? Well, I'll say, first of all, thank you for coming on the show. I've wanted to have you on the show pretty much since we started it, because a lot of my opinions are developed from your opinions, from hearing all of these, like, uh, throughout this entire show, I found myself smiling at multiple points. It's like, oh, yeah, you told me about this on that one six-hour car ride, like, just, like, all these things that I've already heard bef like before from you and the reason that I know. <laughs> Sorry for making you the victim of my rants. <laughs> so um, it's just, I'm, I'm really glad you're able to come on and uh, yeah, that's my closing statement. So do you want to go next or? Sure. Right. Yeah. I just want to say thanks for having me on. I was not expecting to cover such a broad range of topics. So it was pretty, <laughs> cool. It was pretty cool to have a conversation that kind of ranged the way it did. Uh, really like talking to you guys. You're all pretty, pretty smart, knowledgeable individuals, and uh, this is a great show. Um, I listen to it when I'm not participating in it, um, awesome. and uh, I think you guys are doing awesome. And I hope you do it for a long time. Thank you. Well, all right. So I guess mine would be. So first of all, I think that this is probably one of the few conversations that I've had where it has been. I have been pretty much all of my questions on something have been like answered for the most part, completely accurately and without any like BS. So I, 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 I try to not do things where I'm just basically stim, stimulating myself mentally without actually trying to change my opinion. So I would say definitely after this, I'm definitely leaning more libertarian, libertarian because I literally bounce all my concerns off you. I, I'm, I'm still interested in researching more about net neutrality because there are some concerns and interests that I have about that. But for the most part, I mean, yeah, that's just, that's really awesome. I'm definitely going to be uh, thinking about this a lot more. And I'm definitely leaning more libertarian now. It's not that I'm not, I just want to say I'm not, I didn't just come on here to just try to have reaffirm my opinions and anything that wasn't reaffirmed. I am now just going to hide. No, we're having a dialogue. We're having yeah. a dialogue. Yeah. And I'm, I, and I, and I'm, just, I'm not, I'm, yeah, I'm not trying to convince anybody to be a libertarian yeah. or anything else. So you should definitely like, yeah, man, keep reading, keep researching. Yeah. And, I'm definitely, I've definitely changed my opinion. I've definitely changed my opinion. I'm, I'm, yep. And this, is, this wasn't just mental stimulation for the sake of it. And uh, yeah, this was awesome. All right. So uh, I guess thank you, everybody for, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Humanity has been on an epic journey of discovery, learning the truth about the world we live in.
New discoveries about the true origins of humanity, ancient history, free energy, as well as the systematic corruption of world governments are now on the forefront of our daily reality. Is the world headed towards destruction based on control and power? Or is an opportunity now being presented to shift and uplift into a higher consciousness? My name is Mel V, co-founder and creative director of Conscious Consumer Network, an independent broadcast network that was launched on the 1st of January 2015. In the last three years, Conscious Consumer Network has broadcast over 2,800 shows in multiple languages, featuring guests from across the world, whilst creating media that is aimed at the creation of a free, fair, peaceful, just, sustainable world. Conscious Consumer Network provides full training and an interactive support network for all broadcasters, and we are always looking for inspiring and educational content. Hi, this is Lainey Liberty. And this is Miro Siegel. In 2018, Conscious Consumer Network has expanded to multiple broadcast locations, increasing our availability and reach across the world, remaining on the cutting edge of independent media. If we wish to create a better world, we must first create better media, geared towards real education instead of indoctrination. You guys really are what changing the world is going to be about. It's educating kids at a grassroots level. Having become a pillar of stability in the turbulent world of independent media, we have even more going on in 2018. Conscious Consumer Network is a publicly funded network and we rely on all of you to keep us on the air. Show your support for independent media by donating to our 2018 Network Support Fund. Dare to seek a better world. Support independent media.